Welcome to the Boston Structural Heart Course. In this Cardiac Anesthesia Fellowship Lecture Series, we will be going over the second part of presentation regarding assessment of mitral regurgitation. In this specific presentation, we will be going over the echocardiographic assessment of mitral regurgitation in the operating room using transesophageal echocardiography. In the first presentation, we discussed and learned the general principles of assessment of regurgitation of any intracardiac valves. Now, we will be applying those principles specifically to the mitral valve. And as, as in the previous presentation, uh, we have restricted ourselves to the uh, format followed by the American Study of Echocardiography guidelines uh, for the assessment of native valve regurgitation and try to use as many clinical examples and actual echocardiographic clips to enumerate and highlight the specific principles discussed in these guidelines. Enjoy and good luck. So in this presentation regarding assessment of mitral regurgitation, uh, besides following the American Study of Echocardiography guidelines, uh, we have restricted ourselves to the use of transesophageal echocardiography in the context of operating room, whereas most of these guidelines relate to use of transthoracic echocardiography with little reference to transesophageal echo, we have tried to conform uh, the entire presentation to the use of transesophageal echo. And uh, wherever there is any contradiction or something specific for transthoracic echo, uh, we will highlight that uh, that the point at that point in the presentation. So the first and the foremost uh, assessment of mitral regurgitation uh, starts with the recognition that mitral valve does not consist of just two leaflets. It's part of a very complicated mitral valve apparatus, which consists of anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, the left atrium, the mitral annulus, cordae tendine, underlying papillary muscles, and the myocardium. And this is the anatomical part of the mitral valve apparatus. There's a physiological component also, that's the, the milieu of the preload, afterload, rate, rhythm, and contractility in which these leaflets interact with each other to keep the mitral valve competent during systole and non-restrictive during diastole. Looking at the graphic on the right side, you can also see that in the space of the heart uh, anatomy, mitral valve shares a significant portions of its annulus with the aortic valve, and it is pretty close proximity to the tricuspid valve as well. So therefore, assessment of mitral regurgitation starts with two-dimensional assessment of the mitral valve leaflets in the context of being part of an apparatus as well as a broad general assessment of the cardiac structures that includes intracardiac valves as well as all the chambers of the heart. Now there are numerous systems of classification and identification of mitral leaflets. There are American Study of Echocardiography guidelines that are based on two-dimensional imaging that relate to certain specific probe positions and scan plane rotations for identification of uh, the mitral valve scallops. There are also other investigators uh, such as Bolin et al., Foster, Lambert, and Maslow who have uh, put forward their own systems of assessment of mitral uh, valve scallops at various probe positions and uh, scan plane rotations. However, the purpose of this presentation is not to delve into greater detail, but to just to bring out that identification of mitral valve anatomy specifically in relation to various scallops and uh, leaflets is an important aspect of um, you know, mitral regurgitation assessment and therefore every echocardiographer should have a detailed knowledge of the mitral valve leaflet and the specific scallops that they consist of. Now with the uh, ready clinical availability and routine use of three-dimensional echocardiography, this has become uh, rather unimportant. Uh, in the sense that with very little effort and uh, the technology has become so simple that it is very easy and simple to generate uh, on fast uh, views of the mitral valve which are not only physiologically uh, accurate but also anatomically uh, relate to the same surgical exposure that, the, that our surgical colleagues have after left atriotomy, that is looking at the mitral valve through the left atrium and uh, you know, looking at the aortic valve, the left atrial appendage, the coronary sinus, the tricuspid valve, as well as the coaptation line, and uh, all in the same perspective as surgeons do, which has led to us uh, speaking the same language, thus facilitating communication and possibly improving treatment as well as patient outcomes. So three-dimensional anatomy of the mitral valve is very important. 
you can you, you'll be uh, you know you must be amazed that until this point we haven't resorted to any color flow Doppler or other Doppler measures of uh, mitral regurgitation assessment at this point in the presentation. This is because the rule of three-dimensional and two-dimensional echocardiography without any Doppler information is extremely important because there are so many subtle signs in mitral valve anatomy that give give us the can give us and direct us in the uh, right direction uh, regarding the diagnosis of severity. For example. Severe mitral regurgitation is extremely rare when the entire mitral valve is normal. So in the same fashion, if we have a flail leaflet, mitral regurgitation is likely to be severe unless proved otherwise. Similarly, left atrial and left ventricular dimensions not only represent the significance but also the chronicity in the form of a chamber remodeling in response to chronic volume overload. As you can see on the image on the left side, we have a flail leaf tilt, which is obvious by two-dimensional echocardiography, can also be easily seen with three-dimensional echocardiography, and you have a systolic flow reversal in the left upper pulmonary vein, which means without even putting the pulse wave uh, color flow Doppler or any other uh, you know, Doppler on this one, we can be very certain of the severe nature of this mitral regurgitation. Therefore, looking at this uh, graphic on the right side, its importance cannot be understated to realize and to assess and analyze the mitral valve as part of an apparatus and not just two leaflets. Now, coming to the etiology of mitral regurgitation, according to the American Study of Echocardiography guidelines, the etiology of mitral regurgitation has been classified into two broad categories. Number one is primary MR when there is an actual abnormality of the mitral leaflets. And the other is secondary MR, which is because of ventricular remodeling and not because of a primary abnormality of the valve. The most common reasons for primary MR include myxomatous and degenerative changes in mitral valve, infections, inflammatory, and other congenital abnormalities. And this is the one that we relate to more often in the, in the operating room. The secondary MR is because of ventricular remodeling. And then when you do not have any specific uh, structural abnormality of the valve, and most commonly this is because of either an ischemic etiology, second to, secondary to coronary disease, I can see, or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or pure annular dilation that happens more often in atrial fibrillation. And we'll get to each one of these and also uh, try to relate to these specific etiologies in relation to how we approach or how our surgical colleagues approach uh, when confronted with significant mitral regurgitation in the operating room. Now let's get started with secondary mitral regurgitation, that is when there is no apparent structural abnormality of the valve and uh, the primary reason is because of ventricular remodeling. So this is more than likely because of a mismatch or be between the closing forces and the opening forces of the mitral valve. As you can see in this example there's tethering forces that are pulling the mitral valve and the leaflets away from the point of coaptation, and then there are closing forces that are bringing the valve together. When there's an imbalance and when the tethering forces take over, there is a significant apical displacement of the mitral leaflets leading to malcoaptation and significant mitral regurgitation. As you can see in this example, in this animation, on the left when we are initially seeing a normal left ventricle, when it is contracting normally, all walls are normal, the, the, the displacement, there's zero displacement of the papillary muscle or the cordic tendony, and everything is working and contracting in unison to keep the valve competent during systole and non-restricted during diastole, and this patient has trivial or no mitral regurgitation. Now, if the same patient was to have ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease leading to uh, you know, some lateral wall abnormality and outpouching of the lateral wall, as you can see, which is going to be leading to certain splaying of the, of the um, uh, valves and the corded tendony that is going to be leading to significant malcoaptation and mitral regurgitation. Now, you can, you can understand that per se, as such, there is no abnormality of the leaflets. It is only a problem uh, with, the, uh, with the closing or the tethering forces that have led to this uh, mitral regurgitation. Now, we are going to be going over multiple clinical examples of mitral regurgitation because of uh, you know, ischemic and ventri ventricular remodeling. As you can see on the one, this is a globular ventricle, secondary to dilated cardiomyopathy, leading to leaflets that are significantly retracted and having significant mitral regurgitation. In this case, this being a bilateral leaflet restriction, you can see 
that there is secondary mitral regurgitation. This is another example of secondary mitral regurgitation. This time, this patient, you have to take my word for it, had ischemic cardiomyopathy, leading to significant ventricular dilation, uh, uh, depression of the systolic function, uh, and, 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 and increased tethering forces, leading to malcoaptation of the leaflets, leading to significant mitral regurgitation. This is another clinical example, which uh, particularly with this three-dimensional imaging, uh, demonstrates the lack of coaptation of the leaflets. And in this specific example, you can actually see these tethering cords that are pulling the, the anterior leaflet significantly, the belly of it, uh, towards the apex of the left ventricle and keeping it from rising up to meet with the posterior leaflet for significant coaptation to prevent mitral regurgitation. So this is, can be you know, by, can be on both sides or can be only on one isolated leaflet leading to eccentric mitral regurgitation. This is another example of, uh, you know, secondary mitral regurgitation. In this case, you can see, uh, and I can appreciate those corded tendinae both on the posterior leaflet as well as the anterior leaflet leading to bilateral leaflet restriction and significant uh, mitral regurgitation, which is moderate to severe in intensity. This is actually one of the best examples that I have of uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, in which you can see this small hypertrophied left ventricle. Uh, these uh, uh, papillary muscles are significantly thickened, shortened. The leaflets are tethered because of these strut cords that are pulling the belly of the leaflet towards the left ventricle, causing an apical displacement and kind of a seagull sign leading to malcoaptation of the leaflet in the middle and causing significant mitral regurgitation. So the central point of this problem is uh, apical displacement of the leaflets leading to central mitral regurgitation. And as you can see, we can quantify this degree of uh, you know, apical displacement by either, either measuring the tenting height, which is the distance between the plane of the mitral annulus and the tip of the mitral leaflets, that being uh, you know, a certain uh, cutoff. If you go beyond a certain cutoff, that implies that you've had this regurgitation for a while because of this secondary left ventricular remodeling, which is leading to this uh, you know, increased tenting height or a more important one that is tenting area, that is the area subtended under the plane of annulus between the superior topography of the both leaflets, implying the greater the area, the more the tenting of the valve, and the more the apical displacement, implying more chronic and more significant this mitral regurgitation has been. You know. So at the end of the day, as far as uh, uh, secondary mitral regurgitation is concerned, this is something which is because of uh, you know, an imbalance between the closing and the tethering forces uh, of, of, the, of the leaflets, uh, with most commonly because of uh, ventricular remodeling. Uh, this can be bilateral, which is actually a more ominous sign, which means the entire, you know, uh, left ventricle is impacted, which leads to secondary mitral regurgitation. Or this uh, retraction can be unilateral, which implies only a single wall or one side of the heart is involved, leading to eccentric mitral regurgitation. So now we'll discuss of... Uh, the various uh, aspects of primary mitral regurgitation and to refresh your memory. Primary mitral regurgitation is referred to as MR, that is secondary to a primary abnormality of the leaflets or the mitral valve apparatus. So the most important cause of uh, primary mitral regurgitation is myxomatous degeneration of the valve that leads to a spectrum of dysfunctions, as you can see, that starts with billowing of the leaflet, which means just the belly of the leaflets is prolapsing into the left atrium without any change in the position of the coaptation point. That leads to prolapse in which uh, the leaflets are as such intact, but the point of coaptation uh, tends to prolapse into the left atrium uh, beyond the plane of the mitral annulus. And finally, uh, the most severe form of this dysfunction being a flail in which because of chronic tension when there is tone cordae, the leaflet ends up being in the left atrium with the underside of the leaflet being exposed to the environment of the left atrium, and that is referred to as flail. And this has important surgical connotations that we'll discuss in the, in the next few slides. Now, as far as surgical uh, reasons for mitral regurgitation are concerned, we conform to the Car Carpentier classification of the mechanisms for MR, which imply that there are only three reasons that the mitral valve can be regurgitated. Either it is moving too much, that is type 2 dysfunction, either moving too little, which is type 3 dysfunction, and finally, when there is regurgitation despite normal motion of the mitral valve. So as you can see that the secondary mitral regurgitation uh, would qualify for either type 1 or type 3 dysfunction of the mitral valve. So 
while they are uh, different ways of looking at the etiology, but this is uh, Carpentier classification is, does not relate to etiology. It relates to mechanism of MR, and that is either mechanism can be type 1, type 2, or type 3 for numerous etiologies as we'll go in, in, the, in the next few sections. We'll go over and learn these things. So the first one is having a type 1 dysfunction, which means, which is either because when the leaflet is regurgitant, either because there is annular dilation or if there is a leaflet perforation. But it's very uncommon to find pure annular dilation. Either it is happens in dilated cardiomyopathy or chronic atrial fibrillation. When there is significant uh, diff different uh, dilation of the annulus, which leads to malcoaptation of the leaflets, as you can see in this a video example that there's little or no coaptation of the leaflet despite them moving normal and having no structural abnormalities there is significant mitral regurgitation most of the time this annular dilation is also associated with some uh, you know leaflet restriction secondary to uh, you know an, uh, dilation of the left ventricle and restriction and that and splaying of the papillary muscles and chordic tendony but that that does happen another form of uh, uh, mitral regurgitation that is of type 1 mechanism is uh, congenital clefts in the mitral valve, which we very elegantly enumerated in this example, which are deficiencies in the leaflet uh, tissue uh, going as deep as the plane of the annulus from the point of coaptation. Very difficult to differentiate from the leaflet perforations, but three-dimensional echocardiography is one of the most important things in differentiating that. Now, in this one, you can see it as an example of the perforation of the anterior leaflet, uh, which is uh, leading to a significant mitral regurgitation. In this specific patient, uh, we ended up being in the operating room, and this uh, perforation was closed with a pericardial batch with nothing else being done to the leaflet. Another example of uh, mitral valve perforation, again, because of infective endocarditis in this patient with a uh, septic hip, and uh, that leading to a septic emboli, and one of the sepsis leading to seeding of the mitral valve leading to significant uh, infection, uh, uh, perforation in the mitral valve leading to significant mitral regurgitation. Again, the surgery was simply closure of the perforation with the pericardial patch and the valve as such was untouched. Uh, this is another case of type 1 dysfunction, uh, which is again very uncommon to find that is normal di uh, leaflets, but pure and simple annular dilation leading to malcoaptation of the leaflets in the in the uh, in the middle leading to significant mitral regurgitation again dilation may be because of anything but the mechanism of this is type 1 which means the movement and the structure of the leaflet is pretty normal another uh, case of uh, dilated mitral annulus leading to a significant uh, you know malcoaptation leaflets lack of uh, you know meeting in the middle leading to significant mitral regurgitation now where are these examples of pure annular dilation uh, pure annular dilation without any leaflet restriction is rather rare. So these are kind of uncommon examples of, um, of mitral regurgitation happening because of pure, simple annular dilation. Now we come to the type 2 dysfunction, which is the more important one and the one that we uh, you know, come across more often. And then we are asked to comment on the severity as well as the repairability, which again, uh, the suitability for repair is a completely different talk and a different uh, presentation. But like I said in the beginning, the excessive motion is a spectrum of disorders, starting from billowing, which I'll leave for the time being, and concentrate more on either prolapse when the point of coaptation goes beyond the plane of the annulus and uh, flail implying that there's torn cordae and the undersurface of the leaflet is exposed to the left atrium. Now these are better seen and better appreciated in this two uh, mitral valves, one of uh, fibroelastic deficiency leading to isolated flail of the posterior leaflet, and second being Barlow's valve, uh, myxomatous degeneration, leading to prolapse of multiple segments. Now, uh, fibroelastic deficiency is a disease of the, uh, you know, old age, generally uh, old ladies with who have thin, deficient, almost transparent leaflets. We have a short history of MR because, uh, and also have an isolated posterior leaflet flail, secondary to chronic stretching of the leaflets. As opposed to that, the Barlow's valve is a more complicated valve. It is analogous to getting a lot of val valvular tissue which is bunched up in a very small annulus, leading to multiple scallops and multiple leaflets prolapsing. Now, eventually, they could also lead to having uh, you know, uh, flail segments because of chronic tension of the chordate tendony. But to find isolated, each one of these is, is quite uncommon because majority of the time we'll find mixed disease, which I'll go and show to you in the next few slides.
Now this is a classic fibroelastic deficiency. As you can see that there's an isolated P, P3 flail in this patient uh, leading to a f flail of the leaflet and you can classically appreciate that the undersurface of the leaflet is exposed to the left atrium uh, leading to because of the torn cordae leading to significant and severe mitral regurgitation and this is diagnostic of severe mitral regurgitation. This is a, a classic example of uh, uh, flail mitral leaflet in which you can see that the, while the, and the rest of the leaflets are pretty normal and there's an isolated P2 flail with a very characteristic and classic sign of torn cordae which are also prolapsing into the left ventricle, left atrium with each systole. This is another example of uh, fibroelastic deficiency, uh, this time quite uncommonly actually leading to two posterior leaflets, both P1 and P2 flailing, and you can see even the torn cordae with that. So to reiterate and to reinforce this thing that fibroelastic deficiency is common in old ladies uh, who have thin, almost transparent, uh, deficient valves with, uh, of tissue and have a short history of MR and they present with an isolated uh, posterior leaflet flail with torn cordae uh, which leads to severe MR and acute presentation. So that is classic fibroelastic deficiency. And these are numerous examples of fibroelastic deficiency. One again demonstrating a P2 flail. This is a P1 flail, another P1 flail. This demonstrating an anterior leaflet flail both an anterior and posterior flail. This example shows a P3 flail, a classic P2 flail, and again, another P2 flail segment. And this is fibroelastic deficiency. This is something which is easily amenable to repair and doesn't really involve that complicated a mitral valve repair as would happen in other complicated situations. So fibroelastic deficiency often leads to an isolated posterior leaflet flail as opposed to the uh, myxomatous degeneration or Barlow's valve, which involves having, uh, uh, analogous to having a lot of tissue uh, which is bunched up in a small annulus leading to prolapsing segments of both leaflets and the, and the, uh, the point of coaptation prolapsing into the left atrium during systole and going beyond the plane of the annulus. Another important thing that happens in these valves is this thing which is referred to as left atrial disjunction, which is because of chronic dilation and chronic uh, regurgitation and volume overload, the attachment of the posterior leaflet seems to be displaced more into the left atrial side and that's referred to as left atrial disjunction which implies that this regurgitation is not only uh, severe and significant but also has been going on for a while. So it, it implies the chronicity. One of the best ways of actually looking at this uh, regurgitation is that when you look at the valve from various aspects, right, I'll play this slide again that it plays. Yes. So now you can see that this, uh, the, this both leaflets are prolapsing. The point of uh, coaptation is going into the left atrium and while we see this leaflet uh, on the left lower side we see it in on fast aspect but the, the entire pr pr prolapse is better appreciated when you're looking at it from the uh, anterolateral aspect as well as the posteromedial aspect when you see the entire mitral valve almost heaving into the left, uh, left uh, atrium and because of this, uh, you know, the, the three-dimensional perspective, you can truly appreciate the, the, uh, the nature of this prolapse and the number of scallops that are prolapsing and the extent to which they're coming into the left atrium. This is another example of a similar fibro uh, myxomatous degeneration in which uh, both leaflets are involved. There's no apparent overt, uh, you know, uh, prolapsing uh, flail, but there is central mitral regurgitation implying both leaflets are moving and this is also better appreciated in this on fast left atrial view of the mitral valve. Now this is mixed disease that you're likely to you know come across more often than you come across pure isolated fibroelastic deficiency or, or, or uh, myxomatous degeneration or Barlow's valve. As you can see in this one there is a flail of the posterior leaflet which is very long and has a torn cord but the anterior leaflet is also not entirely normal and whereas there's an isolated flail of this uh, P2 segment, but there's some more prolapse of the P3 segment and other pro, other pro, uh, some billowing of the anterior leaf there as well. So this is somewhat of a mixed disease and de you know, demonstrates the chronicity of uh, myxomatous degeneration happening leading to eventual flail segments on these prolapsing leaflets. You know. Then comes another example of mixed disease in which you can see 
pretty much most of the posterior leaflet is prolapsing and the anterior leaflet is also not entirely normal with some retraction and billowing of the segments. These are some of the most complicated valves surgically to repair and in inexperienced hands or in centers where they don't, don't do that up that much of mitral valve, this is sometimes considered an automatic criteria for replacement of the valve because uh, it, is, it is a very difficult valve to repair and there's often residual regurgitation or stenosis that is, that is intolerable and, and, and not, ad, not adequate to leave this patient alone and therefore they end up having replacements. So one of the important things that I want to reinforce, revise for everyone and that is the diagnosis of prolapse. Prolapse is specifically diagnosed only when the point of coaptation of the leaflet goes beyond the plane of the annulus. And flail is when the undersurface of the leaflet is exposed to the left atrium. Chronic mitral prolapse, as it happens in, uh, you know, myxomatous degeneration, is also associated with mitral annular disjunction in which the displacement of the attachment of the posterior leaflet more towards the left ventric, left atrium. And this implies not only significant MR, but also its chronicity that you have to keep in mind. Now, the last example, just for sake of completeness, is type 3 dysfunction, uh, which is, again, uh, because of restricted leaflet, and that's rheumatic mitral stenosis, in which the leaflets are often stuck in a half-open position, which leads to not only mitral stenosis, but also regurgitation. But that, again, is a different presentation, and we will address that whole stenosis uh, uh, pathology differently at a different time. So to reinforce again, this is Barlow's valve, a large uh, valve and dilated annulus, but still longer and thick leaflets, multiple scallops prolapsing and uh, get jetting into the left atrium, leading to uh, a very complex situation of bileaflet involvement and mul multiple scallops being involved. On the other hand, this is clastic fibroelastic deficiency in which by and large most of the leaflets are normal <coughs> except for uh, an isolated P2 flail with multiple chordae that are prolapsing. Now, when you put them together, this becomes actually more obvious. This is fibroelastic deficiency, isolated P2 flail, and this is the Barlow's valve demonstrating bileaflet uh, prolapse as well as multiple uh, scallops being involved in this prolapsing of the entire mitral valve into the left atrium. When you come to anatomical differentiation between these two uh, characteristics, you can find while there are multiple you know, ind indices of remodeling of LV and LA and annulus, but there's nothing that is more characteristic of one over the other. And we can go over this chart in greater detail, but as such, it doesn't really tell as much because most of it is something that you have to look at the valve yourself and diagnose. And the rest of the remodeling and indices of remodeling are based on what, how long this regurgitation has been present for. So now we'll be going over the hemodynamic considerations in assessment of mitral regurgitation severity. So now acute mitral regurgitation that is kind of a scary and emergent thing is uh, far less common that, uh, than chronic mitral regurgitation and usually results in acute hemodynamic instability. Now, the, the caveat over here is that the, according to the guidelines, the combination of hypotension and high LA pressure sometimes results in low driving pressure and therefore lower MR jet velocity and a lower jet area. Accordingly, color flow Doppler does not often demonstrate the true nature of the severity of mitral regurgitation and a finding of a hyperdynamic left ventricle with low Doppler systemic output along with clinical findings should be enough to substantiate the diagnosis even if color Doppler does not show a large mitral regurgitation jet. So if with the history of acute MR, uh, which is not demonstrating uh, you know, significant regurgitation jet, but is associated with uh, significant hemodynamic instability should be construed as severe mitral regurgitation. So accordingly, Doppler imaging often will not show a large turbulent flow disturbance, and thus MR may be underestimated. So however, this is uh, maybe, uh, this is usually something that uh, is, a, uh, is a problem with transthoracic echocardiography because even the guidelines acknowledge that in these situations in acute mitral regurgitation when the severity of MR is not commensurate with the hemodynamic instability, transesophageal echo may be better at diagnosing a severe MR than transthoracic echo is. This is one of the things that is mentioned in the, in the guidelines. So over here you can see a few examples of severe MR. These are patients uh, that came in for emergency coronary artery bypass graft surgery uh, 
after uh, you know failed percutaneous interventions in the cath lab and lo and behold these patients were hemodynamically unstable in this one you can even see an impeller device in the left ventricle which is uh, which is being used to resuscitate this patient and to temporize him from the cath lab going into the into the operating room again a transthoracic echo is not as good as transesophageal echo is in diagnosing mr because often there is uh, you know discordant data that there's a lot of hemodynamic instability, but the jet area is not that big, and that's only because of the lack of driving pressure from the left ventricle into the left atrium that there is not an FMR. Now, there's another. This is another situation of acute severe MR happening in a patient after post uh, after myocardial infarction, uh, leading to significant central MR, which is severe since you can also appreciate uh, floor reversal in the left upper pulmonary vein. Now. The temporal variation of mitral regurgitation is an extremely important part of the diagnosis of the severity and the duration of MR, and that is performed with continuous wave Doppler jet across the mitral valve, which is obtained in the mid-esophageal windows. Now, the intensity of the jet, or how white it is, is really a function of number of RBCs crossing. However, the timing of the jet, how far it extends from systole uh, from the start of the systole to the end of systole really depends on how severe it is. As you can see, this is a holosystolic MR demonstrating a uniform intensity from the start to the finish, and quite predictably, this patient this has severe mitral regurgitation. As opposed to this one, this is an early systolic MR, which means the intensity is very high in the early part, but then gradually dies down, whereas it happens for pretty much the most of the systole, but the intensity goes down pretty significantly lower than the initial part, so may not be as severe as this one is. This MR, on the other hand, is a biphasic MR, which has very little MR in the beginning, but then in the later part of systole, this picks up, and there's significant MR in the later part. Again, various examples showing late systolic MR, late systolic MR, early MR. This is biphasic MR, which demonstrates you know, two peaks, one in the beginning, then there's a lag phase, and then there's a second portion. This is another example of a biphasic MR, which is an early MR in the beginning, and then followed by a faint across. But it is a holosystolic MR. It happens all through the systole. In this situation, this is the most important one, and this we saw and discussed about it in the last presentation regarding general principles of regurgitation assessment. This is called a V-wave cutoff sign in which a lot of volume comes on in, in from the left ventricle into the left atrium, leading to rapid equilibration of pressure between the left ventricle and the left atrium, and that leads to a very sharp decline uh, which, uh, and, and interrupts the the cycle of uh, blood regurgitating from the left ventricle to the left atrium. Often, uh, you know, if you're not looking at it carefully, this is a very careful, this is a very important sign of severe MR. Now, this, uh, the, the duration of mitral regurgitation also has implications for quantitative methods that we had discussed about the vena contractor as well as uh, the proximal isovelocity surface area method because in either one of those when we Tra track the, uh, you know, the, the, the severity of MR, the duration has to be important. For exam the example, in this one, if you track it to the whole extent in this fashion, the way it is this one, you are going to be uh, you know, almost overestimating the severity of MR as opposed to which one in this situation when MR is holosystolic. So in situations when MR is not holosystolic, effective regurgitant orifice area and vena contracta that are Isolated means also based on single frame can offer and overestimate the severity of MR. So effective regurgitant orifice area, as is described by the dynamic regurgitant orifice, is usually derived from a static, uh, maximal values from a single systolic frame can lead to significant overestimation. The same goes for, uh, you know, with the bundle branch blocks. So the duration and timing of MR should be carefully evaluated when situations like bundle branch blocks when the MR happens only a portion of the systole. So EROA to grade MR severity should be used only if adjusted for the duration of MR. Now how do we do that is, is, is left to our imagination, which means you can essentially track or trace only the portion which is intense and, and, and is a clear delineation should be tracked so that it really represents the true uh, nature of effective regurgitant orifice and that. But this is again another very important uh, limitation of these quantitative methods because they do not take into consideration the duration or the dynamic nature of the effective regurgitant orifice area or the mitral regurgitation for that matter.
Another important caveat is mitral regurgitation and general anesthesia. This is something that we in, uh, you know, encounter every day of and uh, deal with this discordance of data, which is you know, something that has been reported significant in the preoperative arena is found to be not that bad in the operating room. And there are numerous reasons for that because it is multifactorial. And a lot of people have done these studies to recreate and reciprocate the uh, or recreate or reproduce the awake state hemodynamics in the operating room to match the awake state hemodynamics and still found that the mitral regurgitation was underestimated in the operating room. Often, uh, when we increase the phenylephrine uh, to demonstrate the phenylephrine channel challenge, all it does is increase the left ventricular pressure to some people, and that leads to an increased jet area, not necessarily an increase in the effective regurgitant orifice area. So therefore, the underestimation of mitral regurgitation severity under general anesthesia is, is multifactorial and is not a single either preload or afterload that leads to this thing. The important thing is to demonstrate that it is present, it is multifactorial, and even if we were to recreate a wake state hemodynamics, this would uh, uh, lead to some improvement in our assessment, not, but not entirely eliminate uh, the degree of underestimation. As you can see in this uh, specific example, uh, this patient had immediate post-induction, was found to have only about trace to mild mitral regurgitation with these uh, you know, hemodynamics of blood pressure being 110 over 75. But as soon as about 30 minutes later when the patient, the blood pressure came up and as his you know, heart rate went a little higher, the mitral regurgitation increased significantly from a trace to mild to mild to moderate. So this is demonstrates the dynamic nature of mitral regurgitation, particularly in the operating room, when the the rate, rhythm, you know, preload and afterload are going through significant variations, and therefore we should keep that in mind that the severity of MR in this assessment can also be dynamic. This is another example of a baseline MR, which we just encountered recently in a patient that happened immediately post-induction. However, when the patient, uh, you know, became uh, slightly hemodynamically unstable, the severity of mitral regurgitation increased significantly. The anti-ischemic therapy was started in the form of nitroglycerin and heparin and uh, some, uh, you know, analgesia as well as beta blockade. The mitral regurgitation severity reduced to its baseline. So, the thing, to, the the most important fact to remember in this uh, in this entire discussion is to remember that the general anesthesia leads to significant underestimation, and the severity of mitral regurgitation can be dynamic and can change for the worse or for better because of a multitude of reasons. Some of them are under our control and majority of them not so much. This is a case that we had that uh, a few years ago in which the patient was referred to us for minimally invasive mitral valve repair secondary to shortness of breath that was exercise induced. Uh, in the operating room when we did a, a post-induction transesophageal echo, we did demonstrate a little abnormality of the posterior mitral leaflet, but there was essentially no mitral regurgitation at all. This was uh, kind of very characteristic of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, underestimation, but to this point that this patient demonstrated severe mitral regurgitation with exercise was something that was very discordant data, and we resorted to the first thing was, like uh, every other medical center, we did a phenylephrine challenge, brought up the pressure to about 160 over 87, along with the fluid bolus, and patient being in uh, Trendelenburg to increase his preload again, there was no mitral regurgitation and the severity remained trace and unchanged. So next we try to demonstrate or simulate the exercise physiology by doing a dibutamine stress echo on this patient. And lo and behold, as soon as this patient underwent dibutamine stress echo, the true nature of his anatomical problem became obvious that he had a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and he had a classic outflow dagger-shaped late peaking gradient of six meters per second with systolic anterior motion and dynamic LVOT obstruction, that was the source of his symptoms and not so much as mitral valve prolapse. He underwent, uh, you know, septal myomectomy and later on mitral valve uh, replacement, but this was uh, canceled at that moment in time because of lack of patient consent, and we didn't want to do it. So, the bottom line being the patient, the mitral valve was perfectly normal under, you know, ideal hemodynamic circumstances, and the slight abnormality was accounted by supernormal physiology. But the moment we created a physiology which was at risk, which was susceptible to his at-risk anatomy, which was a thick septum, he became uh, significantly, uh, you know, uh, demonstrated significant SAM and dynamic LVOT obstruction. The next one is systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Now, this is 
uh, something that we often encounter, particularly in patients who are getting either septal myomectomies or getting surgery, other surgery for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now, systolic anterior motion is purely a case of at-risk anatomy, which is a tall posterior leaflet, a long post anterior leaflet, a thick interventricular septum, and susceptible physiology, which is tachycardia, hypotension, and reduction in preload. This is also something to be kept in mind. And again, we'll discuss more. It's more detail when we talk about mitral valve repair and uh, septal myomectomy for Hokum. But this is one of the important causes of mitral regurgitation, leading to significant hemodynamic instability, which we all should be aware of. So now let's get to the Doppler methods of mitral regurgitation assessment. We have discussed them in the previous presentation of its general principles, but now we will attribute and discuss them in specifically to assessment of mitral regurgitation in the operating room. So starting with the Doppler methods of assessment of mitral regurgitation severity. So there are essentially three methods of uh, Doppler assessment. One is uh, jet area. Number two is uh, proximal isovelocity surface area method. And the third is vena contracta. In addition to going over these three, we'll also go the various derivations of uh, Doppler assessment in continuous wave Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, M mode, or any other of these modalities for assessment of severity of mitral regurgitation. So let's first go over the severity of mitral regurgitation using jet area method. Now this is an excellent method to assess the ex an ex excellent method to exclude the presence of mitral regurgitation. However, as good as it is, and as simple as it is, and as often as we use it, it is imprecise for quantification. And as we'll see in the later part of the presentation, this is an uh, you know a velocity map, not a volume map. The greatest advantage is that it is easy to use. It has been shown to be imprecise in multiple studies, particularly those when the patient the wall is the jet is eccentric, wall impinging, and also it is dependent on hemodynamic parameters, especially the most important one, <coughs> excuse me, being the left ventricular systolic pressure. And of course, uh, you can overestimate the mitral regurgitation when the MR is not holosystolic, when the duration cannot be accurately judged by this one. Uh, you can again uh, look at this one that uh, as you're using three-dimensional echocardiography somewhat improves our uh, spatial orientation and spatial appreciation of the size of the jet in the in the left atrium but again this is purely dependent upon turbulence and not so much as the volume that is coming to the left atrium left atrium and it is subject to the same limitations as 2d color flow doppler is uh, for severity assessment of any regurgitation jet as you can see in this specific example uh, this is a patient who is demonstrating a metasophageal uh, long axis. We are A1P1, this is A2P2, and this is A3P3. There's some mitral regurgitation, but we cannot seem to appreciate the true nature of it. Now, this is a patient who is obviously, in these views, demonstrated as having a P1 flail segment. But when you look at it in uh, two dimensions in the trans um, uh, mid esophageal uh, mid transcommercial view you can see that the regurgitation is coming from precisely the p1 scallop and it is so much pa uh, you know eccentric that it is almost parallel to the plane of the jet which is something that we cannot appreciate with the uh, uh, two dimensional echo with color flow doppler so jet area besides other limitations is highly dependent on how where the jet is headed and where do we intersect the jet and how much of the jet is intersected. So underestimation as well as overestimation is quite common in these circumstances. This is another very classic example of the limitations of jet area. So this is a patient who, uh, the same patient in pre-bypass with uh, hemodynamics which are significantly uh, you know, normal with a systolic blood pressure of 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, heart rate about 56 beats per minute. When the same patient is seen in the post-bypass phase, his blood pressure is 140 over 80 millimeters of mercury, and the heart rate is about 75 beats per minute now. However, when you uh, look at them and assess the severity of MR by simple visual qualitative assessment that is using the jet area, this was graded as trace to mild, and this was graded as moderate mitral regurgitation. However, we were able to describe a good proximal iso isovelocity surface area in these two patients and the effective regurgitant orifice area was judged to be 0.2 centimeters square, which comes around in the range of mild mitral regurgitation, therefore implying 
that the jet area is primarily a function of the jet, uh, you know, the, the velocity of the jet, the amount of turbulence it causes, and not so much as the effective regulation to orifice area or the volume that is coming in the area. So it is a velocity map and not a volume map. Next is the proximal isovelocity surface area method. So this is uh, you align the direction of flow with the insulation beam to avoid distortion of hemisphere of known coaxial imaging. You'd use a zoom view. You have to turn the variance method off, chain baseline and Nyquist limit in the direction of the jet, adjust the lower Nyquist limit to obtain the most hemispheric flow, which looks something like this, and measure the radius from the point of aliasing to the point of vena contractor. Now this is just demonstrating the, the flow convergence, and it is a rapid qualitative assessment. An absence of proximal velocity, you know, flow convergence, despite taking all these measures, demonstrates or implies that the mitral regurgitation is quite mild. However, the problem with the situation is that if there are multiple jets, eccentric jets, or constrained jets that are because of, you know, hitting on the LV wall, you can underestimate that. Sometimes you can have a non-hemispheric shape of the pizza, and you can, you know, overestimate the severity of MR because you're extrapolating information that you got from one image over to the entire uh, systolic phase of the cardiac cycle. So, however, as you can see, PISA in an ideal world, it looks like this. You do the appropriate adjustments and you're able to get a very clean and a straightforward hemispheric swell with a clear delineation of where the vena contracta is and you can measure the flow convergence as well as the vena contracta. So this is happens in an ideal world or in presentations of the kind that I'm making today. In real life, however, this is quite difficult to get the hemispheric shell as well as this uh, exact distance from the point of the flow convergence to the point of vena contractor <clears throat> because this is the source of the greatest error. Now, in an ideal world, you are able to measure the radius accurately. You have a clear, um, you know, aliasing velocity. You have a great, uh, you know, uh, continuous wave Doppler of the MR jet, and you can not only trace it, but also me measure the peak velocity, plug the numbers, and get an effective regurgent orifice area. However, you, you, you realize that since it's, uh, the, it's just a more complicated, but it doesn't necessarily make it more accurate. So having more steps into it builds in more error in each step, and the likelihood of over or underestimation of MR is significant. You know, people have promoted a, a simplified approach of PISA quantification, which has been validated, which means assuming a 5 meters per second MR jet, that is 100 millimeter pressure difference between LV and LA, baseline shifting the colorful Doppler display to an aliasing velocity of 40 centimeters per second, and measuring the alias radius yields a simplified estimate as r squared divided by 2, which means if you have the radius demonstrated by an uh, aliasing velocity of about 40 centimeter per second squared and divided by 2, and you will get an effective regression to orifice area without going into all the... So all you need to demonstrate is the, the flow convergence as well as measure the radius from the flow convergence to the vena contracta. And of course, like I said, this is the greatest source of error as well. But the vast majority of patients' jets have between 4 and 6 meters, for which this approximation is reasonable, but not necessarily very accurate. And therefore, generally in primary MR, an ER array of more than 0.4 centimeters squared is consistent with severe MR, but 0.2 to 0.3 is moderate, and 0.2 with about mild mitral regurgitation. So generally, primary MR and effective regurgitation to orifice area of more than or equal to 0.4 is considered with severe, and 0 0.2 to 0 0.39 is considered moderate, and 0.2 or less is considered as mild mitral regurgitation. So, while I said that the greatest source of error, it seems very easy to perform in, in presentations like this, and in an ideal world, but in real world, there are multiple jets, there are PISAs which are eccentric on sideways, and you cannot accurately define where the vena contracta is as in this patient. So therefore, errors are common, and it has to be integrative approach that we'll talk about in a few seconds regarding the severity assessment of MR. You can also see in these ones, there are actually two PISA regurgitation jets, one coming from the P3 and one from the P, uh, P1 segment, as is obvious, which cannot be as much appreciated in the midesophageal four chamber or the midesophageal long axis view in this patient here. So therefore, optimization and accurate measurement of PISA is essential and have been and, and, and errors are quite common. And as they've said that in errors of almost 10 to 20% are common, even amongst expert readers. And it may be good in describing what is severe and what is mild, but there's a huge variation between mild and moderate and moderate and severe mitral regurgitation. So therefore, 
PISA should always be considered in the context of other echo parameters in Doppler findings, and the dynamic nature of MR can be lead to errors with the PISA calculus that we've talked ad nauseum about. So therefore, that is because it is calculated from a single frame image, and it will overestimate the mitral regurgitation severity when the MR is not holosystolic. Next comes vena contracta, and quite honestly, this is my most favorite mean method of assessment of severity of MR being, being very simple. So all you need to do is get a mid-esophageal long axis view. You get a zoom view, imaging plane, optimal for vena contracta. Best measured when flow convergence, contraction, and expansion can be aligned in the same plane, and you can demonstrate it. This vena contracta is considered to be a surrogate for the regurgitant orifice area, and it is considered independent of flow rates and driving pressure for a fixed orifice, can be applied in eccentric jets, and is less dependent on technical factors, and is very good at separating mild from severe, that is less than 0.3 is mild, and more than or equal to 0.7 is considered severe, severe mitral regurgitation. However, it is problematic in the presence of multiple jets. Convergence nodes, convergence zone needs to be visualized for adequate measurement and overestimation, of course, when the MR is not holosystolic because you are measuring one frame and extrapolating it to the rest of the uh, rest of the systolic phase. So as you can see in this one MR jet that changes its characteristic over the course of the cardiac cycle, there are numerous widths of the mena contracta, and each of them is going to give you a different uh, you know, severity of mitral regurgitation. So we have to be very careful using vena contracta as an isolated means of assessing the severity of mitral regurgitation. So therefore, vena contracta is measured, uh, is a measure of the effective regurgent orifice area. As the jet reverse, uh, emerges from the orifice, a vena contracta of less than 0.3 usually denotes a mild MR and equal to or more than 0.7 with severe MR. A development of 3D echocardiography has allowed direct measurement of vena contracta using multiplanar preformatting, uh, you know, as we'll see in the next few slides. And, and care should be taken not only to measure the highest ADIS velocity is not to include low velocity dark eddies that are not part of the jet core. So therefore, Doppler blooming artifact, which is the Doppler overlay signal over the green, over the grayscale of the, of the grayscale image can lead to uh, significant overestimation of mitral regurgitation severity. That's an important thing. So color flow Doppler 3D vena contractor, color flow sector should be as narrow as possible to improve uh, frame rate as well as line density. You have to align all the cropping planes orthogonal. You can planimeter the high velocity alias signal, avoiding low velocity dark color around it because that's Doppler blooming and can lead to significant overestimation. The problem with this thing are multiple jets in different directions can be measured. They can identify severe functional MR in s some cases. I was subject to color Doppler blooming, limited temporal and spatial resolution, overestimation when MR is not holosystolic, problem with multiple jets and also it is if you're doing a 3D vena contractor it often requires cumbersome offline analyses which again just because of the fact of the operator uh, comfort and expertise in these can also impact the severity of this this method. This demonstrates uh, you know the principle of how we perform a vena contractor in these situations that regurgent orifice is often crescentic shape in secondary MR. In such cases the assumption of circular orifice geometry inherent to vena contracta may result in underestimation of secondary MR. So therefore, uh, use, when using three-dimensional vena contracta, uh, the recent study using uh, demonstrated that anything more than 0.4 centimeters square has uh, demonstrated a severe MR when using vena three-dimensional imaging for assessment of um, uh, the effective regurgent orifice area and vena contracta using three-dimensional imaging. So at the end of the day, vena contracta is the narrowest portion of the jet that is beyond the anatomical orifice area can be either measured with 3D or two-dimensional imaging for it to be measured accurately. Flow contraction, flow convergence, contraction, and expansion has to have to be seen in the same frame. Next comes the mitral inflow velocity. This is af obtained after aligning insulation beam with the flow across the mitral valve at the tips. This is to obtain the E and A waves. In severe MR, the pattern looks like that of uh, you know, a restricted pattern because of excessive volume inflow. E velocity more than one or equal to 1.2 meters per second is a supportive sign of severe MR. A dominant A wave pattern, on the other hand, almost excludes severe MR because that implies there's not significant, uh, uh, you know, amount of volume crossing the mitral valve. However, despite being such a great method of excluding severe MR, 
There are certain caveats that this method is also dependent on LV relaxation and filling pressures. And high E velocity is not specific for severe MR in secondary MR. That's because when there is, you know, uh, uh, no primary abnormality of uh, the mitral valve. And also, it can be problematic in patients with atrial fibrillation. Next is the pulmonary venous inflow pattern, in which uh, you know, your small sample volume, about 0.3 to 5 millimeters, is placed 1 centimeters into the pulmonary vein. You know, your systolic flow reversal in more than one pulmonary veins is very specific for severe mitral regurgitation. Normal pulmonary vein patterns suggest low LA pressures and hence non severe MR. However, it can be problematic in eccentric mitral regurgitation of mild or moderate severity as well as systolic blunting is not a specific sign for significant mitral regurgitation common in secondary MR and present in elevated LA pressure in patients with atrial fibrillation. So the next method is the density and contour of the MR jet that is obtained with the continuous wave Doppler that we've talked a lot about and its, uh, uh, its value in assessing the intensity, number of RBCs that are crossing as well as the timing of the jet. So for this, we have to align the insulation beam with the flow. That uh, The better aligned it is, uh, the, the better will be the signal. It is a very simple method. A density is proportional to the number of red blood cells reflecting the signal. Faint or incomplete jet is compatible with mild mitral regurgitation. However, as we talked about the V-wave cutoff sign, that is a triangular contour, that is an early mitral peak velocity, uh, denoting a large regurgitant pressure wave and hemodynamic significance leading to some uh, some, uh, you know, uh, equ uh, rapid equilibration suggests severe mitral regurgitation. Again, this is a qualitative method, and perfectly central jets can appear denser than eccentric jets of higher velocity. As density is dependent on gain, unfortunately. It can be affected by instrument setting, therefore, and a contour with an early peak velocity is not sensitive for severe MR. It is suggestive. Next come, we come to the quantitative methods of mitral regurgitation. So first is flow convergence and uh, things that we measure with effective regurgitant orifice area. And this then align the insertion beam with the flow, usually in the mid-esophageal views. Zoom view, lower the color Doppler baseline in the direction of the jet, that is towards the left atrium. Look for the hemispheric shape of the, of the best, of the, at, the, at the best low Nyquist limit. And we look for a need for angle correction if flow convergence zone is non-planar. Well, this is a theoretical, uh, you know, uh, situation, but most machines even have eliminated now any angle correction feature in the PISA calculations. And measure a PISA radius at roughly the same time as the continuous wave Doppler peak. So this is a rapid quantitative assessment of lesion severity, measures the effective regurgitant orifice area, and also can be used to measure the regurgitant volume. It is shown to predict uh, outcomes in degenerative and other situations. However, it may not be accurate in multiple jets, less accurate in eccentric jets or markedly crescent, crescentic shaped orifices. Small errors in radius measurement can lead to substantial errors in effective regurgitant orifice area due to squaring of the error, and this is significant. And this is likely to misclassify patients at very large or very small radii, and that's when it should be the most accurate. Anyway, so this is a great qualitative method of uh, you know corroborating uh, the evidence and looking at uh, when you want to really put multiple factors together or multiple parameters together to make a good decision. You know. The next is uh, you know measuring the stroke volume and regurgitant orifice area. This is again a method that is uh, based on demonstrating uh, effective regurgitant orifice area or measuring the cardiac output or stroke volume at two locations and then uh, demonstrating the volume through the regurgitant valve. So mitral annulus is measured at the mid, mid diastole, pulse of Doppler at the annulus level to at the to measure to get obtain the E and A waves. You get the VTI of both E and A waves. Total LV systolic volume can also be measured uh, with the LVOT diameter in the mid esophageal windows and the deep transgastric windows and obtain a pulse wave derived uh, VTI to demonstrate the stroke volume and then calculate the stroke volume and cardiac output at the aortic valve and compare that to the stroke volume at the LV valve. And as we can see that it is quantitative uh, with multiple jets and eccentric jets, provides both lesion severity, you can find the effective regurgitant orifice area, regurgitant fraction and regurgitant volume. And it has been validated in certain situations against CMR in isolated MR cases. However, this is not valid for combined MR and AI. <coughs> It is cumbersome, needs training, small errors in each different, you know, locations of the calculation can lead to magnification of the error. And pulse wave Doppler uh, 
uh, you know, at mitral stroke volume and LV volume can give different results because of varying hemodynamics. So therefore, while it's the most complicated and elegant method, but doesn't make it necessarily more accurate also, because the more assumptions that are built into the calculation, the greater likelihood of error, and is a great means of actually pimping fellows and residents in the operating room, but I haven't really found it better for, uh, you know, actually making a diagnosis to differentiate mild from moderate or moderate from severe. So the way to do it is to have to calculate the regurgitant volume by the difference between the stroke volume of the regurgitant valve minus the stroke volume of the competent valve. Always the regurgitant valve will have a higher stroke volume. Then you can calculate the regurgitant fraction as a percentage. And finally, effective regurgitant orifice area can also be calculated by an extrapolation of the continuity equation, which means effective regurgitant orifice area is stroke volume divided by the VTI of the regurgitant jet. And also, effective regurgitant orifice area can be measured as well. So exercise testing has some value in MR, but that's also in risk stratification and diagnosing in the preoperative clinics, but not so much as in the operating room. Color Doppler inclusive of changes in EROA derived the PISA during exercise can be technically difficult to capture due to tachypnea, tachycardia, and may not may be best performed during supine bicycle exercises, which has its own problems because it doesn't really represent the true nature of exercise physiology. However, increases in effective regurgitant orifice area of more than 13 millimeters squared during exercise have been shown to be associated with symptoms and adverse outcomes. So there is currently no role for pharmacological stress echocardiography to evaluate severity of MR or direct its management, particularly so for risk stratification. So unfortunately, the guidelines put very little about the use of transesophageal echo in the severity assessment of mitral regurgitation. All they say is that this could be used in lieu of transthoracic echo when the diagnosis is ambiguous, the images are not that great, and, and majority of the MR methods can be used uh, for transthoracic echo. However, they do point out that the most of these methods for quantifying MR that have been used with transthoracic echo can be extrapolated and extended to transesophageal echocardiography also, particularly the quantitative methods. However, they do demonstrate a few cautionary tales. Number one being that of the of the role of you know sedation and general anesthesia on the severity of mitral regurgitation, as well as using a higher frequency transducer and the pulse repetition frequency leading to slight overestimation because a higher frequency and a higher pulse repetition frequency transducer can lead to a slightly higher jet area as compared to lower TE transducers. In the final analysis, the guidelines recommend an integrative approach, which means you got to put a lot of things together to make a good diagnosis. And that is to look at not only the structure of the valve, the apparatus, you use the qualitative Doppler methods such as color flow Doppler, flow convergence, use semi-quantitative methods as vena contractor, pulmonary venous inflow as well as mitral inflow to demonstrate the A dominance or the E dominance, and then quantitative methods such as effective regurgitant orifice area, regurgitant volume, and regurgitant fractions. They all have their cutoffs that are better, you know, you can use them and read them in the guidelines and take pictures of this, this slide as well, but it has to be an integrative approach, and not all patients exactly and cleanly follow in each one of these, in, in which, these categories in which a lot of other information has to be placed into the context also. Now, this is a great chart in looking at of how to evaluate chronic mitral regurgitation by Doppler echocardiography. But this is, uh, you know, the most important thing is to diagnose mild MR and severe MR. These are the criteria of mild mitral regurgitation, which means small jet, vena contractor equal to a less than 0.3, PISA radius absent or less than 0.3, mitral wave dominant inflow, soft or complete, incomplete, continuous with Doppler, and normal LA and LV size. When more than all four criteria are present, it is def definitely mild, mild mitral regurgitation and nothing needs to be done. The things that are specific for sway MR are flail leaflet, vena contracta more than 0.7, PISA radius more than 1, central jet more than 50% of the LA area, pulmonary vein systolic flow reversal, and enlarged LV with normal function. When two out of these criteria are positive, then, or two out of these three are positive, then we get into the category of moderate mitral regurgitation. That's where the problem starts. When you have to have <clears throat> grade the MR in relation to its, you know, uh, quantitative methods. So grade two, grade three come around as having moderate mitral regurgitation when effective regurgitant orifice area, regurgitant volume, and regurgitant fractions are proposed by the guidelines. But honestly, we don't do that in the operating room, and we often use presence of these as as an evidence of mild 
or the presence of these is the absence of severe mitral regurgitation, or a combination of both to sometimes just diagnose moderate mitral regurgitation. So whereas these are more applicable to uh, you know outpatient settings and in patients who are getting transthoracic echo, and a lot of these things can be done without the pressure of time, but in the operating room, some of them are not applicable because of the variations in hemodynamics. So therefore, in the bottom line, uh, you have to get, assess the mitral regurgitation in eight of these uh, criteria. Number one, you have to define the mechanism, which is different than the etiology. You have to use multiple parameters to quantify the severity of mitral regurgitation. You have to assess the chamber response to mitral regurgitation, but that signifies its longevity or its chronicity and its significance. Then you have to demonstrate the mitral regurgitation jet. And remember, the best def definition of mitral regurgitation is when jet convergence, contraction, and expansion can be demonstrated in the same frame. The duration of mitral regurgitation jet is an incredibly important finding, as, as limited as it is in its information and has its certain drawbacks and weaknesses. But it gives a lot of information regarding the duration of the MR and the intensity of the MR jet. The quantitative methods should be used as corroboration to what you saw with qualitative methods. Interrogation of acute mitral regurgitation is significantly different than the, the chronic mitral regurgitation because these parameters, because of the low pressure of the left ventricle and low driving pressure, may not be as accurate in demonstrating the true nature of mitral regurgitation. And finally, we should always keep in mind the value of additive testing such as you know, phenylephrine challenge or preload augmentation as well as dibutamine stress echocardiography to uh, simulate exercise physiology in the operating room when you have significant discordance. Lastly, the conclusion is that this concludes our first series of lectures that are based on general principles of assessment of regurgitation and then applying them specifically to the mitral valve. I hope you enjoyed it, learned something, and stay tuned for uh, the next series of presentations on assessment of regurgitation. And this presentation took a little while because of technical difficulties, because of the uh, lack of syncing between audio and video. So I had to record this presentation multiple times. But I think I got it right the last time. Enjoy and good luck.